something. I, I, uh, well, I had we just had some comfort food. My friend Rachel made eggs on toast for us. Yeah. That's disappointing. I to do take eggs on toast. Mm. Eggs on toast. Exactly. Hey, Baba. I love the <laughs> eggs on toast, especially when I have no time. All right. So uh, very lovely to have this beautiful evening. You know, this evening itself is a gift because uh, we have come together for something very special, very personal to both of us who uh, have who came together some years ago to put together the hurt within. And I think that most of us uh, remain good friends. We have many good friends, but probably we remain good friends because we dream together. And uh, this is a dream that both Jadeep sir and myself shared. We wanted to have a book, you know, mm -hmm. that we wanted to read. So uh, a book that would bring together all the voices that we have admired, all the voices who have contributed very significantly to Indian English poetry. Voices who are not just poets, but who have actively mentored poets, who have uh, been very, very active in creating, fostering a sense of poetic belonging, a poetic community. So people who have taken forward, uh, you know, what you call the banner or the flag of Indian English poetry. And of course, there are not just 20 poets from across India. Uh, there would be many, many of them. Uh, but since every anthology has to be selective in its own way, uh, we were thinking of including voices which had not come together before. So the idea was to, as many of you might have read in the introduction, the idea was to introduce a geographical regional coverage, you know, regional coverage of voices so that we did not miss out voices from any major region. So wherever, you know, we had a region uh, as fertile as Delhi or as fertile as Mumbai, where there are three, four, five major poets writing, at least uh, we had to make tough choices. There was also this idea of having a gender balance, you know, to ensure that we have men and women being equally represented uh, in a book together. Because we initially had anthologies with only, you know, male poets because there were supposed to be fewer women poets writing. And then later on, we have so many anthologies today which have simply women's voices. So a kind of balance needed to be brought about there also. So keeping all these things in mind, we had to, and, you know, keeping protocols uh, in mind, we had to work together to craft a community that would be distinct in its own way. So it is not as if these poets have not appeared in anthologies before. It is not as if these poems have not been read by people before. But uh, I think there would be a distinct sense in bringing 200 poems together by 20 poets. And this is what we envisaged. And this is what we are very grateful that it has managed to come out in the shape that we see it in today. The Hurt Within is very, very grateful that we have so many friends. We have so many well wishers to celebrate this book with. And we warmly welcome you to this occasion. But to welcome you formally, I would like to invite Professor Jaydeep Sadangi, of course, my co-editor and my co-curator for The Hurt Within, to talk to you all. Jaydeep, sir, over to you. Good evening, good evening, good evening. Very powerful evening today. And at first, we begin keeping in touch with the expressed. I think our anthology is not a definite one. There will be several anthologies because in a country like India, it's very difficult to come out with an anthology of 20 major contemporary Indian voices. There are plenty. And the assessment is, of course, subjective. But we stick to the principle of visibility, geographical coverage, as well as uh, the thought-wise perceptions of writing for a quite uh, number of years, at least 30 years writing. Writing career is also very important uh, for a poet. So we are, I think, uh, oh, more than happy to uh, collaborate with 20 major voices and they are so kind enough, uh, and they have actually uh, made this journey a reach one. Uh, emailed them, we uh, messaged them, we wrote letters like Jayantada and many others. Uh, we are remembering him because Jayantada is no more. I think this is only one absence in the particular uh, in this evening. And uh, I think Jayantada's poem will be read by. And 
because we have expressed he is the Mahanadi of the book, book because you know he gave uh, the impetus to a vital dose for all of us for writing career taking a poetry as a, as a writing as a habit or also as a way of survival thank you shahita academy uh, the convener of the din convener shangjukta di the convener now malashridi all board members anushur uh, ji is here and all others for continuous support for which we could this is possible in, in this was really something very special journey for us because uh, we learned a lot many subtle tricks we learned and uh, we uh, came out with 20 major voices we thought that there should be a kind of anthology of 10 poems by each poet so that the range is varied and one can have a perception of the poets so uh, also we have covered diaspora but the diaspora is of course not you know you know all over into the world it's only specific it could have been uh, made into other countries as well but hopefully in a in an anthology uh, ahead of us we'll be including all that i think uh, this evening uh, is an evening of the the levels of writing perceptions because the three major scholars, uh, Anishurji, Malishrudi, Meruna, ma'am, all will be enlightening about the book. And there is another part of this particular where uh, the poets will read their poems. And uh, the variety is so unique. The fiesta of poetry and longing. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome you. And all noble hearts, all poets, from different parts of India and abroad, and all poetry lovers, welcome to Art Within. Welcome. Over to Bashudra. Thank you, Jadeep, sir. And we are, as I said, it's it's very personal for us because uh, this is a book that uh, we create jointly with all of them who are aboard these uh, two panels, these two sessions that we do today. Uh, so without wasting any more time, because even we are eager to hear what others uh, have to say about the book, especially those who have uh, you know, motivated us in the journey of creating and crafting a book together. So without further ado, I would like to invite Anissa, uh, Professor Anissa Rahman, who has been one of the foremost uh, literary critics uh, in the country and who continues to inspire us by his rich work. Anissa, over to you. You're muted. Anissa, you are muted. Uh, good evening, friends, and thank you, Bashudra, for inviting me to this, and Joydeep for inviting me to this occasion. Uh, wonderful being here, meeting friends once again. Um, I had the good opportunity of writing a blurb for this book, and that was the time when I looked at the manuscript that was sent to me. But after I had been waiting for that, I had been waiting for that, but once this book came in my hand, I was really happy looking at it and the kind of contents and the way it has been presented. That apart, uh, there comes to my mind an academic question, a question which is typically academic. Uh, as a student of post-colonial literature, I was looking at the three, four locations, especially Canada, Australia, New Zealand, India, these four more importantly than others. And I found that lots of, lots of critical um, anthologies of poems have come out from these four locations. Compared with other locations, that is where English has been taught and where English po poetry in English has been written, but if you look at the entire <clears throat> trajectory of publications in these four locations that I have mentioned, you will get to know that lots of poetical uh, anthologies of poems from various poets have been put together. What is the purpose behind this? What is the philosophy of putting anthologies behind this? And uh, to be able to understand this question, which is a typically academic question, I would take you back to P. Lal's anthology, which was a very important anthology and which was also criticized by many people for certain reasons. <clears throat> that was the time when two groups of poets or two schools of poetry was coming up. Sudeep would know this much better than I do. Calcutta School of Poets and Bombay School of Poets, one led by P. N. and the other led by P. Lal's writer's workshop. Now, that's a very important anthology for me, Indian Poetry in English, an anthology and a credo. You would remember that book that was published, I understand, in 70s, early 70s or late 60s, if I don't remember it correctly. But after that, there have been a plethora of anthologies that have come across. 
and not all of them are important enough. Some of them are just random anthologies. They have been put together. You can't really see any kind of a scheme. Sudeep knows is better than many of us because he is the person who has put at least three anthologies that I know of, maybe more that I do not know of. But he knows the philosophy behind this because you give a road map to the poets and you create a condition for the poetry to be understood and appreciated by others. And that also gives you a kind of a, it's a kind of a, it measures your, 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 your movement, your diction, your affiliations, your voices, your search, et cetera, et cetera. So coming from there onwards, the four decades that I have been watching how this poetry has been put together in different anthologies, I find that there are variations. And a dozen anthologies that stand out, out of maybe two dozen or three dozen that have come during these, uh, after Pilal put together his anthology, anthology and a credo. Credo is very important there because he's trying to underline certain marks along which this Indian poetry in English will be able to make its presence felt. So that is one very important point to keep note of. And that is why, why I'm remembering all these and going into the background, because I want to place this kind of a book that is mapping the mind and minding the map. I want to place this book in the whole tradition that has come to us during the last 40 years or so. Now, these are the poets very interestingly, as I was looking at this book earlier, and as I looked at this this morning to be able to interact with you, I found that very interesting kind of a combination that you have ha that you have in this book. There are poets from 20s to 60s put here. And uh, you have the two very senior most poets, 20s, uh, 1928, I understand, Jayant Mahapatra and 30s, K.K. Daruwala. And from there, you move on to 40s and you meet Adil Joswala and Lakshmi Kanan and Sachi, Sachi Danandan. You come to 50s and you meet Rubin, <coughs> you meet Smita, you meet Rugesh <coughs> Patel and you meet uh, uh, um, Anita. And then you come to 60s and then you meet Tabish and you meet uh, Arundhati. These are, the, I'm name, naming these poets because these are the poets who have given in their bio their dates of birth. That's why I've been able to see that, but others haven't, therefore I can't say. But I understand that these are the poets uh, that uh, Jodeep and, and Vasudra has tried to put together. These are the poets who represent six decades from 20s to 60s, that is those born in the 60s. Now, what has happened during these six decades? It's very important for us to note. And this poetry, this book of poetry, is really a map, a map in many ways. I would say that this is a map of language, linguistic kind of uh, interpinnings that are there in the poems that you can very easily notice. Uh, linguistic intermixing, intermixing with the languages. And you see that it represents various geographical locations as also it represents various linguistic locations. It represents cultural locations. It represents religious locations. And Indian poetry in English is a very rich, is very rich in this respect, especially because you have the other tongue and the mother tongue interaction going on. So suppose, for example, if you read a poet who is not included here in this anthology, like Aga Shahid Ali, you will find the echoes of Persian and Urdu there. If you read Tabish, for example, I'm quoting from the Urdu background poets, you will listen to some kind of a linguistic intermixing that is going on. This is a very important anthology from this point of view, because you have here people who come from Hindi heartland, you come from Marathi, you come from Odia, from Malayalam speaking, Tamil, Manipuri, Assamese, Bangla, and Urdu. The five, eight, nine, ten languages, there are 20 poets and about 10, more than 10 languages in which they have, they come from, they represent their own <coughs> linguistic patterns. It is another very important academic point to take note of and to be able to work on further in this idea. How does Indian poetry in English, written in the English language, echo the language from which the poet comes? And how does it represent the kind of a linguistic tradition, the cultural tradition, and other traditions that come along with that? And how is an Indian, typical Indian poem in English is constructed? Malashri has recently published a book which I haven't yet seen, Mandala. Now, when you think of mandala, you really immediately connect with something, some kind of a tradition. And I will ask you, Manashri, when we meet on 30th, I'll ask you to please uh, give me the address from where I can get the book or give me a book. Better present me a book. I'll be happy doing it. Because it, it, sends me, it sends me certain ideas. Why call it mandala? And when it's there, then you really try to associate it. Uh, and then you try to place it also. So what I'm trying to talk, that is that in this whole process of how this Indian poetry in English and how an Indian poem, which is typically Indian poem written in, in the English language, which happens to be written in the English language, how does it acquire, acquire its identity? 
So these are some of the interesting and important questions that this book really poses forward. So it's really very well titled Mapping the Mind because it maps many things. It maps languages, it maps communities, it maps cultural traditions, it maps entire poetical tradition from which you yourself come out and uh, the other tongue and the mother tongue interaction, geographical locations, say for example you have occasions coming from, look at these poets who come from, they come from various places and various parts of the country, uh, starting from one end of the country to from Kerala and from <clears throat> from Manipur go on to all the uh, central India and north and south. So entire representation of the country, so it is a map, linguistic map, locational map, geographical map, cultural map, linguistic map, all, all kinds of maps. Okay. So geographical locations and cultural locations and linguistic locations are very important to take note of in this book. This book also presents before us a variety of forms that in which we are writing today from a very organized, well-organized stanzaic pattern poems to free verse poems and also to open prose poems that you come across here. So the experimentations that we are trying to make overall, we have been trying to make over all these years are all reflected here. So it's a mini world, you can say. It's a, min, it's, it's a micro, this, this anthology is a micro and it reflects so many traditions of a larger macrocosm that we are part of, all of us are a part of. The forms are important to take note of the regular and the present the, the, the regular and the free verse poem that you come across. So on the whole, what I'm trying to make point, and I would try to cut it short here only, that a new canon that is emerging, especially that has emerged, especially during the past two decades of which we are all apart, either as poets or as critics, because many of our poets, interestingly, are very interesting critics as well. And uh, for example, Mala. For example, me and for example, many of us, Anita, who is an academic, I'm an academic, Mala is an academic, and many of us were academic. Basudara, who is an academic and also a poet. So how do we understand ourselves, our language, our stanza -like pattern, our rhythm, and how do we interact in our own ways with our own language and try to try to transfer it in the language in which we are writing? So this is a kind of a canon making process that we are all being a part of, a very important historical moment actually, in which we are trying to locate ourselves. So this anthology is an effort to locate ourselves. It's trying to put ourselves on the larger map, how we belong and how we hear and how we are being heard and how do we reflect and represent ourselves. So this is a book about ourselves, a book about our own identities, it's book our own language, a book for our own emotions, a book for our own discourses that we are engaging with. Wonderful anthology, I must, must appreciate it because as I said, about two dozen anthologies that I have seen personally during all these four decades or so, and uh, Sudeep so has put together three that I remember, starting with Mapo Collins and Sahit Academy and one more which I'm forgetting. So you will see that this is how it is going up. In the process we are, as, as Joydeep just said, that it's not a very definite anthology in the sense that many more are to come. But at the same time, many in random anthologies are also there, which we need not bother about, worry about, because when such things happen, many things do also appear, which really don't hold good for a long period of time. So good books will stay, and I understand this book is going to stay for long because it has certain very interesting points to make. As far as I'm concerned, I look at it as a kind of an experimentation in which we are trying to locate ourselves and create our own scenario for ourselves. Thank you very much. I hope I haven't exceeded time, but so if I have exceeded, my, my apologies for that. Thank you so much. You oh, touched upon so many wonderful uh, corners of this particular book. Thank you so much, Anishujo. Uh, your words mean a lot. Thank you so much, sir. We have some certain connectivity problem with Mamang. Uh, Mamang Dai has joined. Mamang Dai needs no introduction. We go straight to um, uh, Arunachal Pradesh. Uh, Mamang, could you uh, read a couple of poems? Mamang, Mam, you're muted. You're muted. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. I better get on in a hurry because we're having a lot of power cuts, you know, it's just come back on. Mm. Anyway, good evening, everyone. Happy New Year. Happy 24 to everyone. To you too. So I'll just read, uh, okay, I'll read one poem from the book, the wonderful anthology that Joydeep and uh, Pasudhara have brought out. Okay, so. This is an old poem, but still, it still remains as I wanted it to be. So I think it hasn't changed over the years. 
small towns and the river. Uh, just a little note, this was actually written for uh, an aunt of mine who died young and uh, the body was brought back from Delhi in uh, on the ferry. So I have always wondered whether it is good to date poems and who it is dedicated to or why it was written, even though I don't like to explain much. It's only very recently that I told my cousin that it was actually written for her mother. Small towns and the river. Small towns always remind me of death. My hometown lies calmly amidst the trees. It is always the same in the summer or winter, with the dust flying or the wind howling down the gorge. Just the other day, someone died. In the dreadful silence, we wept looking at the sad wreath of tuberose. Life and death, life and death, only the rituals are permanent. Mm. The river has a soul. In the summer, it cuts through the land like a torrent of grief. Sometimes, sometimes I think it holds its breath, seeking the land of fish and stars. The river has a soul. It knows, stretching past the town, from the first drop of rain to dry earth and mist on the mountain tops, the river knows the immortality of water. A shrine of happy pictures marks the days of childhood. Small towns grow with anxiety for future generations. The dead are placed pointing west, when the soul rises, it will walk into the golden east, into the house of the sun. In the cool bamboo, restored in the sunlight, life matters like this. In small towns by the river, we all want to walk with the gods. So that... Wonderful, wonderful. One more, we'll see. Lovely poem. Mama. Shall I read one more, Joydi? Sure, sure, sure. Hmm. Okay, this is not from the book. It's not uh, published. It's just one of the poems that uh, it's it's new. It's called "In Seeking." The wind is pressing my ears flat. Do the fires still burn in those small houses? that steep path, stepping on boulders, hugging trees, up. We were always climbing up. In seeking, our faces were golden. My homeland, how have I described you, one after another, sharing everything in a landscape winged with stories, the same as clouds moving across the sky, carrying seeds of rain. It was our arms striped with light, ablaze with heat and thought. In the sun, our faces were golden. Stringer of beads braiding the moments. The truth about life is desire. It is the mad soul that rises, rising with the wind. When the roads are washed away, the sea comes crashing in, beating against a coastline, a towering memory saying, here I am, do you remember me? Skyline, daybreak, midnight, everything is gathered in one place, the lost pages of details, the gaps and breaks in days, in a lighthouse by the river, tilting with songs about the burning stars, a twisting string floating in the well of time. Is that the curving eye of the universe? It is a curving ear listening. In seeking, our faces are golden. Thank you. That should do it, I think. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you for joining.
Thank you. Thank you, Joydeep. Yeah, I would love to uh, sit in. You all were inspired. All Thank of you. All of us were inspired. Over to Vashudhara. I think uh, Bashubidi is to go. So can we accommodate Bashubidi and ask her to read a few poems? Oh, yes, yes. Bashubidi, certainly. Yeah. Bashubidi. Over to Bashubidi, over to Bashubidi please. Yeah. She yes. needs no, no introduction at all, I think. <laughs> oh, yes, sir. <laughs> Um, just for Professor Rahman, I, I am going to be 70 this year, so, <laughs> <laughs> so this is a special year for all of us for various reasons, I mean, uh, my uh, Neil and me, uh, so thank you very much. Uh, the first poem uh, I'll read from this marvelous anthology, and thank you so much, Boshudhar and Joydeep, for putting it together, I really appreciate that, and lovely to see all of you, and sorry to have to rush off after this mm. this difference the difference between you and me has been carefully architectured in the segments of your imagination for centuries we bartered amicably we cultivated irrigated constructed without inflaming friction then the competition began for opportunities that were not enough for our sharply growing population it was then that you built your raging kiln and shaped each brick with putty with questionability in your conflagration, piling up brick on brick, your raging, sorry, piling up brick on brick to form a scalding wall between us, each grain coerced together by hate and upheld by a conviction that has driven me to a land I didn't know, to rivers I have never set my boat afloat in, in another nation. You can take the house I was born in, the roads I walked, the crops I grew, and deny my education. You can tell me I do not belong with yours, that you and I were never friends in our years of subtle integration. You can divide lands, houses, forests, people, mountains, lakes, roads, and jobs through lines of interpretation. Lines that carve up rooms and fields and create blocks, invisible but true, only in your imagination. And when you try to harness the streams and split the sky to nurture dreams of absurd divisions, you forget that nature deems each effort of your little of your futile greed to allocate as an interruption to her continuities, her continuation. And with my, and with nature, my mind flies to invade your precious guarded skies with renewed determination. You cannot take what lives in me of nostalgia and memory. You cannot make me settle down in this town that's not my own. And how will we now decide to call our own and divide our literature, our arts and songs, our rituals round what's right and wrong? But in the world's fair scrutiny, wherever they see you and me, they cannot see this difference that we have built through inference. Lovely. Love is the there, poem. Is there another one? Or shall I just leave? No, Bashubidi, please read one more poem. Well, uh, that was a bit of a serious one. Uh, uh, and I'll end with my poem to grand my grandson, whom I'm going to pick up just now. Louis' heartbreaking request. For you, my little Louis, the entire world outside is the garden where on many windy days and days when it is cold, you tell me with that honey dripping voice of yours, did I, I don't want to go to the garden today. I want to sit on the sofa and watch TV together. Such little wishes, which we cruelly dismiss as a child's whim. So when you pleaded the other day, seeing Grandan and I had our coats on, ready to go out to have our vaccine boosters, 
your melting eyes and heartbreaking smile, your gentle, urgent request, did I? Please go, don't go to the garden today. Please don't go. Could not hold us back to enjoy the warmth of your unstinted love and joy of having our company when you most wanted it. My lovely little Louis, a wish you will grow, I uh, a wish will probably outgrow as you make friends and value playtime with them which is what we wish for you. But for now, when you most need us to sit with you and play with you, we feel our grown-up tasks are more urgent than your little angel pleas of not going into the garden for now. Thank you so much, Basha Bidhi, particularly for reading out this poem. Uh, which has always been one of my favorites. Uh, thank you so much. And a wonderful discussion that uh, Anissa brought to us, especially when he was talking about the nuances of language. Because, yes, it is one of uh, the most important concerns in Indian English poetry that we talk about this vernacularization of English. So how English adopts and adapts from the vernaculars. So just as we have anglicized all our vernaculars, we have also vernacularized English. And that needed to be brought to the forefront. So one idea, as Aniso so very rightly identified behind this geographical coverage, ensuring a, a geographical coverage so that all regions of the country get representation, was so that we could uh, bring to uh, attention these nuances uh, in the register of English that varies from one region to another. I'm very, very grateful uh, Anissa that you spoke about this and indeed um, you alone could have spoken about this with your background in languages and linguistics thank you very much and uh, so we move ahead with the book discussion and we invite uh, Malashri Lal Professor Malashri Lal who has as Anissa pointed out and it's a wonderful book Anissa you are in for a treat you read mandalas so I hope you get to read it soon. A uh, beautiful book. Uh, and uh, of course, Malashilal has been at the forefront of uh, uh, in general and uh, in poetry, uh, particularly uh, these last few years. Uh, so Malashidi, we are very, very grateful that you're here to speak for us today. Over to you. Good evening, everyone. It's indeed a great privilege to be speaking to all of you today. And on this particular collection, which came to my desk as it did to yours, congratulations, Jaydeep and Boshadora, for an absolutely outstanding volume of poems that you've put together. And whenever a new anthology appears, there are two kinds of curiosities. One is, what's the philosophy of selection that the editors have um, authorized? And who are the writers in it? So I'm sure those are very difficult questions that both of you picked up and answered. And unlike other genres of writing, which can quite easily be called post-colonial, post-feminist, post-independence writing, with poetry, it's immensely difficult to make a selection because it cuts across all those genres and all the many language issues that Anisur also pointed to. So when I pick up this book, uh, it seems to me that it is uh, a wonderful act of literary cartography. And I want to build in the next few minutes this whole idea of cartography and why, as almost like a scientific discipline, this book goes into certain themes that have not been explored before and not quite talked about in the way that this anthology places before us. And as a cue to that, I turn to the introduction by Bashobi and, uh, uh, sorry, by Boshudhara and Joydeep. And I'm just reading a line from that, where they say that in the introduction, this book was written, and I'm quoting, to entice uninitiated readers into poetry and into academic work on it. So there is a very clear agenda of change and a very welcome one, because when one wants to teach contemporary Indian writing in English and poetry, it's very difficult to find a book. And there's too much controversy because of the selections that are, there are, but this one will probably not meet any kind of resistance for the following reasons. 
So I've chosen three themes to talk about uh, where I feel that the poets and the poems sort of open up the idea rather than draw attention to themselves. And I've selected these uh, samples uh, from poems and po uh, from poets who are not going to be speaking this evening. So if one were to look at rubric one, which is the need for academic analysis and the potential that these poems have for it, I'm going to choose something from Arundhati Subramaniam, and particularly a poem called Mitti. Precisely what Anisur was talking about, the transference of one language and the vocabulary within it, the implications of that vocabulary into another kind of an environment. Now the word Mitti, and that's what the title of the poem is, unexplained in any kind of a subtitle, has a huge resonance in almost any culture. But I'm going to quote exactly four or five lines there to point in the direction that Arundhati is suggesting Mitti can do. It becomes for her a symbol of poetry itself. And I'm quoting, and so I uncovered the old role of poets to be messengers between moon and mud. So she starts the poem by saying how as a child she would eat mitti, and many children do that. And it ends on that note of cosmic resonance. And we all know that mitti is associated not only with childhood play, but with death in one form or the other, and with the last rites in almost all religions. And therefore, it's a theme that picks up something which is universal, at the same time that it is located in the particular resonance of the word mitti and the culture from where that word is picked up. Now, I'm moving very quickly from that to a second aspect of what I have called literary cartography, because here I'm looking at the geographies that have entered this particular book. There are so many poems that recount places and place names. There are cities, villages, mythological sites, and there are imaginary worlds. And I'm choosing here as my example, Keki Daruwala's poem, which is called Patna to Nalanda, 1979. And my reasons for selecting the poem A, because I think Keki is very special for all of us in this program, The Heart Within, and also because this is yet another poem which is using the idea of map making and the resonance of language in terms of place names to open up to something very much larger. Now, the title points to 1979, and this is India before globalization. This is before India, when Nalanda has not yet morphed into an international university with all kinds of uh, knowledge systems being uh, inducted into it. This is a Nalanda which still belongs to the old Bihar that we knew it as. But what exactly is Keki pointing towards? Again, I'm going to read just four lines from the poem. Mendicants, wandering in search of a thirst. Thirst, come looking for a monastery. The cotton boat twangs as it twanged in the days of the Buddha. So what Keki is doing here is a reminder of the great university that Nalanda was and the great humility with which knowledge was produced and disseminated. This idea of abdication of the material and the embracement of the wealth of knowledge is very much a resonance in this particular poem and a very important reminder for those who are reading your anthology and looking at this poem today. So I do want to congratulate you, or is it KQ who sent you this particular poem? because what he is noticing is the contrast between the Buddhist practices of then, and of course, Keiki has known the, the globalized India and how things have changed, but he is reminding us of the poverty that there was in Bihar, 
a material poverty at the same time that there was intellectual excellence and intellectual traditions. So not Patna, it could have been Pataliputra, but he calls it Patna, Patna. And he reminds us that Nalanda has remained unchanged in its name, but it has changed a lot in what that name implies. From that, I'm going to move to my third and last point. And here I'm going to pick up uh, something that was mentioned um, by Voshudhara um, when talking about uh, the need for gender representation and yet not pushing it too hard. And I'm glad that uh, both Jordeep and Boshudhara decided not to make it into a sort of a women's territory when you're looking at the women poets. And here I'm going to um, pick up uh, a, a, a few lines and a sample uh, from Usha Akela, not only really because she's individually a good poet, but also the spearhead for a Matwala festival and a concept which brings South Asian writing together. And we've got Anita here with us. So when one is looking at that kind of a map of the woman subject, what is it that this anthology is doing? And I'm going to read a few lines from Usha Akela's poem where I like the title very much. It's called The Rosary of Latitudes. So the word rosary picks up a sort of a religious intent, but it is also using the word latitudes from map making, which points to the imaginary nature of that map making in the sense that we know that our lives, our seasons, our decisions in many ways are linked to those latitudes and longitudes in which we reside. And yet, these are imaginary lines. We don't exactly know where the equator is. We can't touch it. We don't exactly know where the Capricorn line, etc., is. Because these are imaginary lines, but they influence our actual lives. And that is the kind of women's lives that she and others captured in, in this book that you have brought before us, which is extremely fascinating. Because it's it's the, the the latitude also has multiple meanings, and we, especially when one talks about the woman subject, the idea of latitudes and freedom and liberalization and and engagement, all that is uh, in, uh, it's sort of clustered around the whole idea of latitude in the sense of freedom. So that just makes me conclude that it's a very important. Um, book that both of you have put together. And uh, as Anisur said, that the purpose of a, of a map is that it actually generates more maps. So your cartography, valuable as it is, is going to bring about further thinking and further maps and further books. So thank you for opening that marvelous doorway into studying poetry with conviction and with the analytical tools that as poet teachers that many of you are, this has been brought to an audience. And I'm glad that Saith Academy has published this book. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much, Malishwati. Thank, Thank you so you. much for Keki Darwala and Jayanta Mahapatra. Both um, no, we, we worked hard in hard and hand in hand as well as we came out with the poems together. So we suggested the poems, the Kakeki, we want to include these. And he granted, then we proceeded. And a similar thing happened with Jayantada, so that the coverage is you know, so wholesome. Thank you, Malushudi. You are always such an inspiration for all of us. Thank you. Over to Vashudi. Also, incidentally, it is Keki sir's 87th birthday tomorrow. So um, good that, uh, Malushudi. We are very grateful that you brought in his poem and you brought in conversation about him. And so it's two years to the last 85th birthday that we celebrated at the heart with it, that it was beautiful. Uh, thank you very much for your observations on the book. And you did such a beautiful coverage of all the ideas. And also, you brought in poets who are not here today and who hope uh, we hope will join us in the future sessions for the book. Thank you very much. And from uh, Malashri Lal, we move over to Miruna George, who is joining us from uh, 
the south of the country. So here also we wanted to have some kind of a geographical coverage so that critics would talk about their reception of the volume uh, across uh, the, you know, the territory of India. So uh, Miruna Ma'am, thank you very much for joining us today and over to you for your observations on the book. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I just uh, texted uh, uh, Jaideep in, uh, earlier that uh, something went wrong with my laptop. And right now, I'm relying on my mobile. So I will be going off camera and uh, hope you all don't mind. Thank you. Sure. It's absolutely an honor and privilege given to me to share my thoughts and impressions amidst this August gathering after being given a rare chance to preview the anthology of poems written by a very gifted and special group of poets edited meticulously by the poet and erudite scholar, Dr. Jaideep Sarangi and Dr. Basudara, a passionate poet and a discerning scholar herself. While I was going through the content page, I could notice that these poems, handpicked by the poets themselves, appeal to one's senses and intellect with a range of subjects covered within the pages of the book. Some poems soothe one's senses, providing a familiarity with the subjects, tones, and contexts that are evoked, that one succumbs to the magic of imagery and contexts, making one feel that the poet is echoing one's own thoughts, aches, or anguish. Certain poems in the anthology whisk you to a past, a time when life was all easy and cozy with its predictable turns of anticipated joy. Nostalgic and fulfilling confirmation of emotions universally felt and acknowledged here. Certain poems resonate with hard truths that one cannot avoid experiment in terms of experiential facts and harsh realities that unravel over the course of one's life like the poem Autumnal Leaves that says, letting go is not an easy choice. The act of reading poetry itself is personal, as the text material absorbs slowly as mere words and phrases transform into notes of appreciation or acknowledgement of the sensory, the sentimental, and the sacred. Poems like Small Towns on the River, The Voice of the Mountain, and The Missing Link Connect the readers with a primordial understanding of all that these natural elements evoke. The river that has a soul, as in India, where rivers are sacred, and it goes without saying. And it goes without saying that the immortality and sanctity. A kind of a connection here almost like an eco-conscious thought, which is the need of the hour. Similarly, the voice of the mountain foregrounds the mountain as an old man sipping the breeze that is forever young. In her poems, the deep consciousness of community represented by the natural elements like the river, the bamboo forest, the water and the mist, and the mountains resonate with the collective consciousness, marking the years of collective memory. There are poems like the one that evoked the memories of a grandmother dressed in a starched sari, enveloped in the fragrance of a soap, a particular brand which she had used always, that almost makes you blink your tears away as you remember your own grandmother by catching a whiff of the soap smell floating in the air. You suddenly understand the meaning of a line like, I quote, intimate emptiness of its rooms, unquote, that haunting memory of a room lived in, but announcing its emptiness, hollowed by the pain of an absence. Coming to Lakshmi Kanan's poem, Haldi and Mahaprajapati, here we see women who are made to give up one's personal identity, to be of any value in a world that knows only a man's way of being, shaving the head that qualified Gautami to be a Prajapati and a poet to retrieve her poetic script from the bottom of a frozen dish smeared in haldi that appears saffronish, almost bloody in color. 
is itself a radical expression voicing protest and injustice that in a world which proclaims itself as liberal and equal the alpha woman needs to be more like a man this poem actually challenges those of us who teach gender studies to undergrad and postgraduate students to ponder over as to where the line blurs more of a man and less of a woman indeed so the 21st century woman is still looking to find a balance between work and home and the quest continues ask for the moon again questions the gender restrictions with regard to the recital of gayatri mantra at the ritual of the brahmo pradesh when landscape becomes woman by arundhati subramaniam is the best example for a teacher as to how to teach formalism the sight of the mother viewed by little girl peering through through a keyhole works as a magical hat which transforms the ordinary into an extraordinary experience the detailing of the hibiscus colored silk sari the glass of iced cola convexity of a mole on the upper right arm the arched feet all of these paint a freshness to the mundane presence of a mother in a child's life by blowing fresh air into this ordinary entity of a woman the poet has brought out the many layered personality of womanhood often taken for granted for the roles she plays but never for the person she is a discovery indeed i speak for those with orange lunch boxes is another heartwarming poem it's almost an ode to all those so called ordinary yet extraordinary beings since i'm from madras i couldn't avoid this poem titled madras just to mention a few lines that i find brilliant in terms of imagery of course and thought provoking i quote my mother sari hectic with moonlight still crackling with the voltage of an md ramanathan concert concert unquote another line here the vast opera of the bay of bengal flambed with sun unquote finally i would like to end by quoting tortus things contain in themselves so many things you can never just name them like adam they are themselves and always something else unquote poems are vehicles of meanings peddling the philosophy of life upholstered by metaphors and imagery meant to transport the readers either inward deep into one soul or outward to the nether world thank you thank, thank you, you so, so much. much thank you thank you very much for your observations and um, Uh, grateful that you could join despite your laptop acting up today uh thank you and uh we move over now to uh though we have had readings in between we move over to a very delightful reading session uh i would like to invite um, anita nahal to begin the reading session by reading some of her poems from you over to you anita di uh, good morning everyone good evening for everyone in india and uh, thank you to basudra and jaydeep super congratulations for an amazing anthology that you put together so beautifully summed up by professor rahman and uh, dr mala shri lal um the mapping of the mind that you both spoke of physically location and emotionally and for an historian like me uh, by training Uh, mind mapping is a tool we use a lot in classes you visualize history and then you make a chart literally of events and dates so this title and also the cover and the inside cover which is also a beautiful uh, representation and it and it says here which emphasizes the cartography that everyone was talking about that this is a a uh, scene that depicts three soothsayers interpreting king sudhodana and it, then it says here below them is a seated scribe recording the interpretation so the mapping of the mind and minding the map and uh, in uh, recording and interpreting so congratulations for all those elements that come out in your book I'm going to read out two poems. The first is called "What's Wrong with Us, Kali Women." There's nothing wrong. Nothing wrong. That's your fear labeling us. We are the Kali women. 
and all other female, male, androgynous gods. We don't distinguish, we seek, we learn, comprehend, embrace. We are the Kali women in the forefront, striding and yes, strutting our stuff too. Some men gulp and gawk, making a tight knot of patriarchy right in front of their balls. They are the same who have been boning before Kali statues for centuries, marking their foreheads with mitti from her robes. And then they call her Ma Kali and walk away brash, brazen, evil. Don't think she's not watching. There's nothing wrong, nothing wrong. That's your fear labeling us. We are the Kali women and all other female, male, androgynous gods, always in front, straddling between pathways, poles, blocks, and behavior, between screams and footsteps, pining for justice denied, justice battered, justice flagged, murdered, burned, their dark skin, their gender, religion, their sandals, blood stained, their clothes drenched and smelling of your foul breath, with your hands striking, your feet jutting and hitting. And then some in their sinister voice sing well into the murky night, Makali, 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 Makali. Don't think she's not watching. There's nothing wrong, nothing wrong. That's your fear labeling us. We are the Kali women. My skin is Kali, my heart is gold. My soul is a child, cries, laughs, jumps, feelings flow like fresh churned cream from cow's milk. My skin disgusts you, yet, to, yet you try to tan yours. My skin disturbs you, yet you find it exotic. My skin you call Gandhi, but I am clean, I bathe. In winters when my skin lightens a bit, you proclaim I am soft, fear. I'm always clean. It's your mind that is dirty. Even mock bathing in River Ganga might skim above your falseness. Makali, 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 Makali. Don't think she's not watching. I have time, Basudra, to read another. Please. Bye. Yes, please. So this one is a poem that I wrote when we were in the middle of COVID. And while we're not still entirely away from COVID, or there might be a resurgence, so this poem I wrote at that time, and I wanted to share with you. It's called, What Happened to Their Clothes? As I was doing yoga, laying on the carpet in my bedroom, I saw my clothes hanging in my open cupboard. They seemed oddly silent. I wondered if I would ever wear them again to dance, to work, to the grocery store or anywhere. Tears swelled up. What happened to the clothes of those who died from COVID-19? Are they still hanging in their cupboards? Still waiting to be worn to wo work, dinner or theater? Still waiting to wrap their owner's bodies? What happened to their beds and their comforters? Are they still waiting to give sleep to their owners? Why am I thinking of inanimate objects, I asked myself? Why wasn't I thinking of their loved ones left behind? I suppose the news of their bodies being quickly driven away by body collectors in hazmat suits, never to be seen by their loved ones again, made me cry more for their clothes and bed sheets, that their loved ones would never see them in again. Thank you. Thank you so much for these beautiful poems. And uh, from Anita Nahar in the US, we move over to Sanjukta Das Gupta. Uh, Sanjukta, I invite you to read your poems. While at the same time, I want to tell Anissa that you were uh, right on in remarking uh, you know, about the academic and poetic connections in the book. Because incidentally, you know, out of the 20 poets, I believe at least 15 of them are academics. Uh, most of them are in English departments, but they're also like Anita Nahal in the history department. Uh, and 
so I think th that would be another point to ponder on, because mostly uh, when we look at it in poetry, uh, th there is a problem between you know the, the creative side and the critical side. And also 2024 being the centenary of Nassim Ezekiel, a person who so brilliantly brought uh, you know the critical and the creative together. Uh, I think that this also becomes a very significant point to think about, uh, and it was there at the back of our mind. So thank you, Anissa, for you know spotting that connection and for talking about it. And this particularly because I'm introducing Sanjukta Dasgupta, another well-known poet and critic. So Sanjukta, the over to you. Hi everyone. Good evening, and thank you, Boshidhara and Joydeep, for putting this book together. And I think I have uh, a little memory of how the book came about, because that's the time when I was uh, uh, the convener in Shaita Academy. And uh, it was, we were all very, very pleased with your proposal. And all of us who were on the board okayed it right away. Uh, and then what were, made me really happy was the fantastic gender balance, 10 women poets and 10 male poets. I don't know whether you did the arithmetic or not. And so you uh, fulfilled one of the needs of the United Nations SDG goals, yes, by <laughs> bringing it all around. And uh, But however, the non-binaries have been left out. And I think the next time you will map that. And now in the poems uh, that you have included of the poems I've written here, I since Anita read about Kali, what more can I do than to read about Lakshmi? So, and this is a very, very different uh, Lakshmi because she chooses to be unbound. And so I'll just read uh, this poem. And uh, the poem was inspired by uh, both Virginia Woolf and Rabindranath Tagore, where T Tagore made such scathing remarks in his poem, Mukti, Freedom, about, uh, about the role of Lakshmi and Sati. And so he says, everyone says, I'm Lakshmi Sati, an extremely good woman. So this is a sort of a deconstruction of that role. Don't, don't call me Lakshmi. I can't ever be Lakshmi. I want to fly kites. I want to climb trees. I want to read and write. I want to sing and dance. I want to climb mountains. I want to swim in the seas. I want to do what I like whenever I like. I want to be mad, I want to be bad, I can't be in corners of four-walled spaces. I can't be in eddies, I want to flow in the mainstream. I want to be in whirlpools, I want to roam and run. I want to eat fruits from trees, I want to drink to the last drop the juice of grapes. I want to cook for myself. I want to dream, I want to pace the rainbow art in a spectacular hallucination. I can't be Lakshmi. I will never fail this endurance test. I have to speak, I have to cry, I have to scream. I have to laugh, I have to swim in rivers. I cannot swim in pools. I want to fly like an eagle, I want to glide like a feather. I will forever fail this endurance test. I have flung off the sellotapes on my lips. I will sing the freedom song. I may not be Lakshmi, but I am. I just can't be Lakshmi. I have to break the silence. My wealth is not jewels. My wealth is my gypsy spirit. I I can't be Lakshmi. I can't be good, saint, silent Lakshmi. I can't be the angel in someone's house. I don't want to be a disembodied spirit. I don't want to be Lakshmi. I am a Lakshmi. Trap me if you can. So, thank you. 
should i read a second one or was it too long yes please. yes please do please please okay. another so i will um, change from uh, a feminist poem because i i'm very branded about that and uh, can i read a new poem for uh, from another book or should i read from this one no no any any book anything anything what should i do please read dhoti dance any, okay. anything <laughs> All right. Oh, okay. Because Sudip liked it. And so I'm going to read that. Yeah. Uh, just a minute. I'm scrolling it up. I hope I can find it. Uh, yeah. So Dhoti Dance has nothing to do with Lakshmi and yet a lot. All right. Dirty dance. Those were the days when it was not about twirling the moustache. It was not about dancing in nightclubs. It was not about challenging the choreographer. It was not about grabbing the chance, chance, chance to dance, 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 the lungi dance. There was no music and drums as the dhotis and saris danced on the streets to face the imperial rod of power. Soldiers striped their backs. Soldiers handcuffed them. But they sat like boulders. It was a dance of Satyagraha. It was a dance of non-violent non-cooperation that shook the foundations of the British Raj. The frail old man in a dhoti led the British such a dance that their pantaloons and pajamas slipped off as they pranced and danced. It was not chance pay dance. It was the determined dhoti dance. The youthful old man had choreographed the freedom dance. A nation danced to his tune. A nation danced towards freedom as Mohandas, Karamchand, Gandhi, the frail brown man in a Capri dhoti, led the dhoti dance. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful, Sangyukta Di. Wonderful, I really love the ending. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, I'm cool. very naughty cool. about the Capri Dhoti. <laughs> yeah, the Capri Dhoti and Gandhi. <laughs> really, it's really captured Indian by Indian theme expressed in English. Wonderful, thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Sangyukta Das Gupta so, and Keki and Daruwala, the two poets in the collection who have been able to, uh, who have made it possible for the collection to be analyzed in terms of humor also. So uh, very, uh, you know, very satire and humor combined in both of their poems, very beautifully. Thank you, Shanjukta Di. And Thank from Shanjukta Di, we move over to uh, Sudeep Sen, who is uh, uh, joining us from Delhi. And uh, Sudeep Da has, of course, not only been a poet, but he has, as Anissa pointed out, he has also been the indefatigable editor of various poetry collections. Uh, thank you, Sudeep Da, for joining us this evening. And over to you for your wonderful poems. Mm -hmm. Thank you from a very, very cold Chitturanjan Park, Bangali Pada. Um, first of all, I just want to congratulate the two of you. You've done a sterling job. You know, what a cracking team. Um, you, I think, complement each other really, really well. And it's just, it's just good to see good work being done. You know how passionately I feel about poetry. And, and you know, it's, it's labor of love, only a labor of love. You're going to become rich overnight through royalty, I assure you, from the Academy. But I think the most important part, which has already been uh, the, the point which has already been made, is the interface between the actual crafting of poetry and the inspirational aspects of poetry and the pedagogical part of that aspect thing. Um, I feel that a lot of very, very good poetry is being written in India and has been for a long time, so even if you're talking about specifically English. But our critical uh, side of poetry is very poor, even now, apart from 
you know, stray essays in a book here and there. You know, it's very difficult to collect one whole book of outstanding essays. And hopefully this will change. I mean, uh, it was a very good idea, for instance, to have Anisur, Mala, and uh, Miruna. Thank you, all three of you, for providing a context which is very important. Um, so I'll just read three, uh, two poems. Um, they're all new poems from my last book, Anthropocene. And, they, and these two, both these poems are actually based in my home city of Delhi, both actually based in Chitaranjan Park. Um, uh, I write a lot from my study um, when I'm not traveling. Um, so you're talking about latitudes and longitudes and cartography. Uh, my cartography is, when it comes to emotional cartography, it's very Bangali. And when it comes to other kinds of cartography, it's very cosmopolitan. So it's a cusp between cosmopolitan and Bengaliness. That's where I come from. So this one is called Disembodied. And it was written uh, during the pandemic. Um, and of course, it talks about Delhi, but it could be any big city. My body carved from abandoned bricks of a ruined temple, from minaret shards of an old mosque, from slate remnants of a medieval church apse, from soil tilled by my ancestors. My bones don't fit together correctly as they should. The searing ultraviolet light from Aurora Borealis patches and etch corrects my orientation. Magnetic pulses prove potent. My flesh sculpted from fruits of the tropics, blood from coconut water, skin colored by brown bark of Indian teak. My lungs fueled by Delhi's insidious toxic air, echo asthmatic sounds, a new vinyl dub remix. Our universe where radiation germinates from human follies, where contamination persists from mistrust, where pleasures of sex are merely a sport, where everything is ambition, everything is desire, everything is nothing, nothing and everything. White light everywhere but no one can recognize its hue. No one knows that there is color in it, all possible colors, body, worship, not for its blessing, but its contour, artificial shape, shaped by Nautilus, skin moistened by L'Oreal and not by season's first rains, skeleton strength not shaped by earthquakes or slow molded, by fearless forest fires. Ice caps are rapidly melting, too fast to arrest glacial slide. In the near future, there will be no water left or too much water that is undrinkable, excess water that will drown us all. Disembodied floats, a float like Noah's Ark, no GPS, no pole star navigation, no fossil fuel to burn away, just maps with empty grids and names of places that might exist. Already, there is too much traffic on the road. Unpeopled hollow metal shells without brakes swerve about, directionless, looking or an elusive compass. And the other poem I read is called Om a Ceremony. Um, and it has um, since we were talking about intertextuality in language, um, I suppose it's a given that all of us are great admirers of Shahid, Aga Shahid Ali. And uh, I knew him very well as a young poet. He reviewed my first book. So um, that was very special. 
And he was not only a very, very fine, sharp critic, but just a fun guy too. You know, so he wore his scholarship very lightly, which is not the case with a lot of people. So as a homage to him and, and specifically his uh, translation work, uh, Begad Maktar, for instance. And um, so there are lines in this particular poem which appear in italicized um, form. And I'm not going to flag them because you know which lines they are. They are Shahid's lines. I got into a lot of trouble for this poem. Um, interestingly, this does not appear in the Indian edition, but does appear in the UK and the US edition um, because I've been trolled for this. And you'll know why. Om, a sermont. And it has a epigraph from Goethe, and I quote, architecture of frozen music. In my city, I'm surrounded by constant cries of the dying, burning pyres heaving under burden of wood, smoke, and bones, wailing summed up by sonic notes of om. Civilization's first sound, Sanskrit syllable echoing a conch shell's harmonic mapping, its involute spiral geometry holding within an emanating airborne sonar screams. My ancestors, grandmothers, mother, blew into the smooth shell cupped in their palms, held intimately as if it were a talisman, a prayer, a pranayam in yoga's daily ritual. But breathing is such a privilege these days. Pandemic struck, oxygen deprived, my friends perish, the country buckles airless. Even an exquisite ceremony lacks the sheen or wax to wrap the contours of a corpse now. Each day as I write endless condolence notes, etching dirge-like couplets on gravestones, my city continues to be dug up, not to make space for burial sites, but for palaces of illusion. An architecture of frozen music, greed, calumny. A country without a government, a country without a post office, Shahid laments. Let me cry out in that void, say it as I can, I write on that void. Own celebration now, an unceasing requiem, yet we chant in hope for peace. Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Wonderful, Shudipda, wonderful, wonderful, mesmerizing, Thank mesmerizing. You. Thank you so much. And you have edited so many important uh, anthologies, as Anishuji already pointed out. So who better than you can map the trajectory of the history of the anthology? I think Thank that is very important. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, yes. We cannot conclude this session without a reading from Jayantada's poetry, because he was one of the persons who inspired us, us so much. So I request Bashudhara to read one of his poems included uh, in featured in this particular book anthology. And uh, with one more note that we would like to organize three more uh, three more events to complete all 20 uh, poets in the book, in the anthology. So we uh, look forward to your cooperation, suggestions to make our way in to reach farther heights. Over to Bashwadara to read uh, the poem. Thank you, Jerry. So I'll read a very short poem, which is incidentally also very powerful when you look at the title and the words. So it's just five, uh, a nine-lined poem, and it is titled, A Missing Person. In the darkened room, a woman, 
cannot find her reflection in the mirror. Waiting as usual at the edge of sleep. In her hands, she holds the oil lamp whose drunken yellow flames know where her lonely body hides. That's it. And uh, the draft that came to us or that we managed to have, you know, it initially had a punctuation at the end. And uh, I remember very distinctly because with Joyantada, we had to send him the drafts physically. He was unable to access emails. And Jadeep sir would do that. He would get the poem typed out and he would, you know, personally post it to him. And uh, even though he was very sick, uh, we found when the draft was returned, you know, he had attended very personally to all the editings and he had cancelled out that punctuation mark that appeared at the end. And he said, this is not to come. So uh, the kind of, uh, you know, that shows the kind of, um, commitment that one has to poetry, that one has to words on the page, that one has even to a full stop or a comma, you know, that you don't let it go. Uh, that is how uh, I think we have learned from these people who have who we have brought together in this wonderful collection. And as we have tried to say, they are not just poets. They have been, uh, you know, they have been uh, at the center of the various places that they're located in. They have been championing poetry in these places. For example, Sanjuk Dadi heads the Intercultural Poetry and Performance Library. And there, there's a lot of activity going on there. There's a lot of mentoring that is being done there on a daily basis. Opportunities being given for poetry to come to the forefront. Ways by which you know poetry can be therapy, especially for young people and the kind of discontent that we are living in in our times. Uh, poetry also serves as a very important space for therapy for healing for bringing you know untold narratives so i think in a big way these are roles that we had in mind uh, these are role models that we have in mind and we hope that uh, there will be further books uh, which uh, for example we just have out of the 20 poets here 15 are from india and there are five from the diaspora so with just five, we could not bring together all, uh, you know, all voices. So we have concentrated on the US and the UK uh, majorly, and all these five voices are from there. So uh, the kind of um, poetry that is being written in the diaspora also, you know, it, it makes it, it it distinctly changes the tone of Indian English poetry as a whole. So I think these conversations should also take place, the conversations between diasporic poets and Indian poets, and what they are overall together contributing to the thematic, the linguistic canvas. So we are very, very grateful that uh, so many of you could join us for this evening. And as I said, again, uh, this personally means a lot to us. So may this journey continue. And uh, I would like to ask Jadeep sir to formally deliver the vote of thanks for the session. And Bashudara, there is no vote of thanks because... Smita is not reading? Yeah. Ha, Smita ma'am is not officially reading, but yes, Smita ma'am, you can... Yeah, yeah, please, please do, please do. Yes. 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 Because we will be organizing. Yes, yes. please do. It's, it's late now, so... Yes. And that, and you read one poem, no problem. Please, they're, they're planning, they're planning sure, sure. others. In fact, so I don't what? even have the book in the room. I don't have the book in the room. I'm so unprepared. Any so poems? Next time. No, no, that's Any okay. Poems? Next time, next time, because it's getting late for everyone now. I have to also rush for dinner. Uh, so we next are, time you. Yeah, you we are organizing sex. four uh, yeah, groups uh, yeah. now because Arundhati will be reading next time. So we'll be like right. that. We'll plan yeah. it that way. We'll cover all twenty poets. Thank you so much. So each one is a journey it's because. As Mashudara pointed out, is that all subtle relationships are exper uh, experience giving, isn't it? How can we all forget Jantada's beautifully handwritten letters, which reached us, isn't it? If we mm -hmm. can treasure them and come out with a volume, I think that will be an important uh, anthology, as it was done for C.D. Narasimaya, as Professor Narasimaya wrote letters, and you know, uh, and I think uh, Professor Bulbarga, uh, you know. Uh, Balaram Gupta collected and com I know, came out with a collection of essays, uh, letters uh, from, uh, I know, he collected the letters from different sources. I think oh, what a mess for all of us as Jayantada, you know, single headlet uplifted the thing of poetry, Indian poetry in English. And we are celebrating so many major voices from different parts of, the, of India and abroad. And Indian poetry in English is so confident now. No one can deny its mighty, mighty presence in the world scenario. 
and taking a cue from Bashudara's, uh, you know, last sentence, we need to be poets as well as we need to be an activist like uh, Pablo Neruda or Seferis, isn't it? You know, we we are not diplomats in writing in poetry, but of course we are the critics writing in poetry. So uh, no, there should be an occasion, I think, uh, Eden Gardens, whole Eden Gardens will erupt, receive a poet <laughs> from India, as it happened to Pablo Neruda, isn't it, after, it, after receiving the, uh, you know, the coveted Nobel Prize, uh, you know, isn't it, when he returned to his own land? Because poetry is an act of survival. We are committed to it. That is the magic, I think, the magic that uh, Bashudara was hinting at. I think the magic rod is in the hands of the Indians. We are so confident, and uh, the college goers, student, you know, school goers, in fabulous, fabulous experiment, range, wide range of poetry. So thank you for all inspirations starting that we started with Anishuji. Is always, you know, uh, inspire us like that. Malashridi, thank you so much. You are so versatile. Every time we <laughs> listen to you, it's a kind of treat. Uh, Miruna, thank you so much for your perspectives. And all poets read uh, so many important poems. I think the poet poem, uh, which was uh, the first poem by Mamang, which is a part of university curriculum in most of the universities now, isn't it? And that is an iconic poem. So Anita Di, Shudipda, thank you, Smita Di, uh, Di, Bashabi Di, everybody. You know, it's a fabulous journey. We live together. Thank you so much. Thank you. You made this evening so, so special. Thank you very much. I just want to say, just, it, yeah, I'm going to have dinner now, but you've already filled me up with so much love and affection. <laughs> thank you both.